Okay, it's been long. So uh, before we start the class, what I wanted to, oh, let me turn this mic this way. There we go. Uh, before I start a class, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your Quran routine. So again, we talked about how um, the amount of time you spent uh, in the week, inshallah, Monday to Fridays. Uh, and if you want to do more than that, you want to do seven days a week, go for it, inshallah. But at least bare minimum, dedicate those five minutes just in case if you miss the class, either online or on site. Uh, you should already have an alarm in your phone dedicated to reminding you every single day, at least Monday to Friday, inshallah, to spend five minutes in the recitation of the Quran. And then after you've recited that portion, then go to the translation, inshallah, and you can look at what you've read as well. Um, multiple benefits for you guys. Number one, there's so many vocabulary words you are learning every single week. You are bound to come across some of them. There are so many verbal tenses. There are so many prepositions. There are so many things that you are seeing and learning in grammar. And as these things start to pile up, having a constant Quran routine will help you be able to see these things throughout the Quran, not just isolated. Like, for example, in your drills, everything's isolated for you to understand what's going on, the vocabulary wise, the grammar wise. Now you're going to basically be thrown into the Quranic ocean, right? Um, and on top of that, it'll help you with your reading fluency. One of the most important things for comprehension of a language is, sorry, one second, this. one of the most important things for comprehension of a language is that the ability to be able to read, right? If you're not able to read fluently, then how can you try to understand something if you're struggling to get through reading it, right? If you're going, um, al all your focus is on trying to get the words right, right? Your focus is not on what does this mean, right? So comprehension has to, is going to come, but you have to put your effort into also reading fluency, mashallah. So um, reading fluency, it'll tremendously benefit you. The barakah, just having a daily Quran routine. And on top of that, starting from the beginning of the mushaf, it'll show you what consistency can provide you. Five minutes a day. So some of you, mashallah, you know, you were able to read in the two and a half minute challenge that we did in the first day of class. Perhaps you were able to read maybe about one page or half a page. Okay, well, if you start multiplying that up very quickly, you're able to finish a juz in the course of a couple of weeks or in a month. Or maybe you're finishing two juz in a month, right? And imagine by the end of this program, you've recited five more juz, 10 more juz than you would have. And imagine that you're making this intention that this is my khatam that I'm starting now. And by the end of Ramadan, it might be the first Ramadan for some of us to finish the entire Quran because we had this, this boost, this push. And especially for Arabic students, for Quranic students, and the lesson that we're going to talk about today, that connection with the Quran is so essential, right? And we can get disconnected very, very easily. We have life that pulls at us. We have work that pulls at us. We have family that pulls at us, obligations here and there, our own entertainment and our enjoyment and kind of trying to de-stress. Everything pulls at us in different angles, right? The only way the Quran takes a precedence in our lives or it takes priority in our lives is if we make it a priority, right? Just by virtue of this class, your relationship will not all of a sudden, you know, develop with the Quran. You're going to be able to be in this class and learn new grammatical principles, you're going to learn new vocabulary, but it's on each and individual, each and every single one of us as teachers and as students to be able to say, I'm going to make time for the Quran in my life on a daily basis. And if this class is the only time that you're saying, this is my time for the Quran, this is like the, the, the preparation ground. The actual experience is when you are with the Quran yourself, right? This is just a little bit of like help, the training wheels. This is some assistance and facilitation. But really, the relationship is not developed in the class. It's developed outside of the class. It's what we do outside of this class. And obviously, this will help and um, bring more value, inshallah, to, to understanding the Quran, understanding what we're reading. And also, it'll humble us quite a bit as well, especially as you start off. They'll be like, I don't know a single word from you. Anybody, that, as you guys are reading your passage, do you pick up at least one, two words or any kind of grammatical thing that you remember learning, right? I promise you, this will also motivate you as you get a month or two into the program, you're like, oh my God, I'm, you're just like, you're like almost having to pause every couple of eyes. You're like, I know this thing, this thing. It's like, I know 10% of what's going on and 90% I have no idea. But the more and more you go in this journey, that number starts shifting more in your favor. I remember the first, um, so we were at Bay, you know, as students and uh, we had moved closer to Valley Ranch before they have this much of the new campus that they had. And this is before Sheikh Omar was even there. So this was, Sheikh uh, Yasser was there. 
um, and he led Maghrib prayer. And I think we were like about three, four months into the program, uh, full-time program. So imagine you guys are doing it part-time, three, four months into the full-time program. He, le I, I don't even remember what he led. I just remember the happiness and the joy that both Sophia and I experienced. And we only realized, obviously, when we came afterwards, we're like, oh my God, that first raka'ah, I think 80% of what he recited, we understood that. And then the most humbling part was the second raka'ah, don't think I caught a single word of what was going on, right? That's the part of the Quran where like certain passages are like, oh, this is this simple vocabulary, what's going on over here, I can follow it. And then all of a sudden you get to passages that are much more complex in vocabulary for beginner students that maybe they haven't gone over that vocabulary or some of these grammatical concepts or the ayat are much, much longer and there's multiple sentences and concepts going through. And it was humbling because the first work out, amazing. Second work out, we're like, oh yeah, we're still Arabic students, right? We, we are definitely in this mode. So you'll find that maybe you, the imam is reciting something or you're hearing something in the Quran, you're like, oh my God, I got it. And then you're like a 20 minute stretch and you're like, I think I got like the word out over here and fee over here and inna. But besides that, I have no idea what's going on. So this is part of the journey. Um, don't let that be something that demotivates you. If you're looking at all the amount that you don't understand, then starting this journey was almost like useless. Like, what was the point? Like, there's definitely way more than we don't understand, right? In the Quran and the entire depth than we do understand. The whole point is to be able to enjoy that journey. And if you lose the joy of this journey of trying to learn the Quran and being a student of the Quran, you'll lose hope. You'll be like, oh, I'll never get it, right? You're never going to be a master of the Quran. You're never going to understand it the way that, for example, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu understood it, right? It was his language. It is something that we are trying to strive for. So number one, just like any, uh, uh, um, any uh, venture that we go on, we ask Allah's help first and foremost, and we put our effort in, right? That's the best we can do. And for some people, it comes super easy. It comes very, very naturally, right? Some people are able to pick up this language like this. Others, it takes time, right? I would say Sophia was, it came much faster to her. And for me, it was like, after like going over the concept over and over and over again, I'm like, okay, now I get it. And then when I started teaching it, I'm like, oh, okay, now I really get it. And then when I started like going over the notes again and going into the Quranic studies itself and going into the deeper side of it and seeing the not just the, the the theoretical part of it but the application and then the exceptions to the application it's like oh wait a minute what i thought i got i got that concept but how it actually works in functionality in the quran there are so many deeper layers to it right like literally right now we're giving you the foundation and the 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 base of your entire studies but as you learn as we go through like you know more advanced classes and do it more advanced stuff so you're like oh wait a minute all of those things are the base foundations and there are layers to this. I would even say your vocabulary, for example, um, when we get to the idea of root letters and we go into those, the depths of the word, right now you're learning, for example, fi means in, okay? Right, you're meaning the word alif lam means uh, al, it's the particle d. You're learning right now, uh, ar-Rahman, it means the merciful, right? But each of these words, they have deeper connotations and connections that are made. Like if you look at an Arabic dictionary or a Quranic dictionary or a, a, a lexicon, right? You're not going to have very simplistic definitions, one word answers. In most of these dictionaries, you have these massive uh, excerpts for these words that you're like, wait a minute, I thought it just means one word, right? But that's why there's the depth and the beauty of this language. And any language has this feature, but the Arabic language is so rich in this feature. And it's also a very vivid uh, language. It has a lot of imagery to it. And we'll start seeing that as we get deeper and deeper. And, and personally, I've seen uh, many programs and institutions that they like to kind of throw everything at the student at once. And I hope you guys can appreciate the simplicity at which we try to tackle the, the, the actual language in the beginning. And then you start building up. Because many times when you start throwing like balagha and the most deep stuff, like we can throw gems here and there. But if your entire study is to go like PhD level from like level one, you're not going to get too far, right? Many people lose heart and they're like, there's too many exceptions. This is the rule. Now you give me the exception. I'm just getting overwhelmed by this, right? So having a, a methodical approach to it is very important. And that's what we found when we were students and we taught it. And a lot of people benefit from that. And then, mashallah, we've had students who have gone on to different Islamic universities. We've had students who have gone on and specialized and mastered and they can, you know, um, uh, they're, they're far more advanced than Sophia and I when it comes to Arabic poetry and these kind of things. Like they went into the depths of the language, right? But you start off with a solid foundation.
And I hope that's something you're, you're getting in Chella from this program. With that, let's go to uh, the topic at hand. So again, for those who have not put their um, alarm on or they have not set that alarm, go ahead and get your phone out and put that alarm. Everybody should already have uh, an alarm that whatever time of day that is. So maybe for you, most convenient time is after Fajr or maybe it's right before sleep. Whatever it is, put that five minute timer on and say to yourself, I can dedicate five minutes to the Quran and recitation, inshallah. And recommendation, even if you memorize that passage, interact with the Mus'haf. If you can have the physical Mus'haf with you and you're actually having a Mus'haf that you're going through, it's great. But at the same time, I get it. We're busy. Sometimes we're going to school, work, and you want to just use a digital copy and you can easily bookmark it and come back to it. It's fine as well. But by having that physical Mus'haf and being able to place your finger and read through it, um, there's a lot of value in that as well. Just connecting with the Mus'haf. Okay, Bismillah. Let's go ahead and get into our topic for today. We talked about tadabbur and deeply reflecting over the Quran. We talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Quran um, something that was mubarak, something that was blessed, that gives you beyond what you can expect. I'll share with you one more story about the Quran and how the Arabs were mesmerized by it. Um, and you really don't, we don't really read the slides because there's not any details over there except just the names and stuff. But uh, I'll give you one of the stories which was narrated uh, by Al-Akhnas bin Shuraiq, who's one of the Qurayshi leaders, right? And we talked about there's no de facto leader. There's no one singular leader that was seen as the head, but he was one of the people who was from the elders or the, the leaders of Quraysh who would gather together. So this is in a time where da'wah is... Um, being done publicly, but the Quraysh, the main, uh, you would say the main kind of thing they're propagating about this is that stay far away from him, right? Don't listen to him. He's a liar. He's a madman. He's a magician. They're, they're saying all these things. So now if they are saying to the common folks, the leadership is saying to the common folks, don't listen to Muhammad Sallallahu and what he has to say then they themselves can't be there in public listening to what he has to say because then they're obviously it's it's, it's the, the biggest flaw of a leader, right? The biggest flaw of a leader is if you see hypocrisy in that person, you don't want to follow them. You don't want to take them as a leader. So they wouldn't be able to even listen themselves as leaders to the Quran in public because if they did, all the followers start saying, well, if you can listen to it, why can't I listen to it, right? Why are you telling us not to listen to it if you're listening to it? So what did they do? The Messenger of Allah وسلم, would gather in a home, sometimes in his own home, it would be that of Al-Arqam, right? He would go to the home of Al-Arqam and the Muslims would gather together and they would go over the Quran in a time at night time when night falls, right? There's not street lights everywhere, right? Once after Maghrib, it's an Isha, it gets really dark. You can kind of engage privately in places and, and people are not, you know, going to uh, bother you too much. So al ahnas bin Shuraik narrates that as the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was reciting in this home, he went at nighttime in the dark of night and he stood there listening to the Quran. And the entire night goes by until the point where Fajr time is about to start. And now the, the brightness in the sky, the light is starting to come a little bit, right? And he says, okay, if I stay here any longer, the people will start seeing where I'm at, what I'm doing, and it's going to be a problem. So he starts getting away from the home. And as he's starting to get away from the home, he bumps into Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl. And they're all in the same vicinity, right? And this is like, you know, hands in the cookie jar situation where like everybody's hand was in the cookie jar at the exact same time. And they're like, hey, what are you doing? Why is your hand in the cookie jar? And it's like your hands in the cookie jar at the exact same time as them, right? And they basically say, okay, we're not going to come back again. We're not going to do this again because we know what's going to happen. If anybody sees us, we can't be seen listening to the Quran if we're telling others not to listen to it. The very next night, they both, they all come again. And they say, okay, we're not going to do this again, right? We've, we've listened to it. Two nights in a row, these non-Muslims are listening to the Quran and they come for a third night. And after this third night, three nights in a row, hours upon hours of listening to the Quran. Now, remember, the Quran is Meccan and Madani, right? There's Makki ayat and Madani ayat. In the beginning of Revelation, right? Maybe maximum, there was maybe one, two, maybe three Jews of Quran that was revealed at this point. You know how, how quickly you can go through about three Jews of the Quran? In a couple of hours, you can go through and loop through one, two Jews easily, right? You can go through those. 
So imagine them coming back, hearing the same ayat over and over and over again. And the only thing that's pulling them away and saying that we're not going to come back anymore is the perception of others. Otherwise, they would have just kept coming back and been like, I need to hear what this is. What's going on over here? What's being said? Al-Akhnas, he says, well, first they, they first vow and swear on everything, you know, holy and sacred to them. I promise, I swear that we're not going to come back. It's, we, we can't come back again. It's going to be bad for us. It's going to look bad. So Al-Akhnas, the very next morning, he goes to Abu Sufyan and he asks Abu Sufyan, yeah, Abu Sufyan, what do you think? about what we heard, because they all knew they heard it together, but they hadn't really done the reflection portion of it, right? Like, what, what do you think about this? And Abu Sufyan says, by Allah, there are certain things that I understood and I knew them very well. And I knew what he's talking about. And there were other things which their implications aren't very clear to me yet, right? It's not clear to me yet what it is. And I also, this, this can lead into a couple of different, you know, uh, opinions in terms of what he's talking about. But remember that the Qurashi, Arabs, the Arabs that were there, they knew there was one creator, right? Even Allah says in the Quran, if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, Allah, they would absolutely say it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But same way how there's polytheistic religions now, their concept was we need these idols to be able to ask God. We cannot ask Allah directly. We will ask these idols. And then it evolved even more to we will ask these idols directly right so shaitan always starts in that middle range and then he goes all the way to the end so the implication also about that they, they believed that they would ask quote-unquote idols and gods but they didn't believe there'd be a resurrection they didn't believe that a person would be questioned they didn't believe that what you did in this life was going to be taken into account so there were many things that the implication is like wait what is going to be a resurrection what are you talking about I'm going to be asked about what I'm doing in my life. What do you mean, right? And these are things that were the core principles that came down in the beginning. The idea of establishing tawheed, the idea of understanding there will be a resurrection, the idea that you will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the idea that there is a heaven and a hell, an idea that there are consequences for what you do, and there's also a reward for what you do. So these concepts were, for them, unique, very strange. So al akhna says, Wallahi, I feel the exact same way. By Allah, I feel the exact same way. And so they didn't have a negative reaction. They didn't have a, either a positive reaction either, but it was just a neutral reaction. Then al akhnas goes to Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, when he's asked about what he thinks about this, he describes it very vividly. And you can tell even in, in their negativity or their hostility towards Islam, they were still people who were very like, like eloquent at times and they were very poetic in, in the way that they spoke. He said... That the messenger of Allah, he's from Banu Hashim, right? This is a sub-tribe in Quraysh. Quraysh was not just one tribe. There's many sub-tribes among Quraysh, right? And he's from Banu Hashim. And Abu Jahl is from a different sub-tribe. And Abu Jahl says that Banu Hashim, the, the sub-tribe of the messenger of Allah, Salaam, and our various tribes, we would always be racing back and forth like two horses, in a race that kept on going back and forth, back and forth. Once they would take the lead and we would take the lead and they would take the lead and we would take the lead. And he even describes when it came to, for example, uh, giving charity or helping those, the hujjaj that would come in any realm, we would go back and forth when it came to our battles and scrimmages. And when it came to our poets and, our, and the people that we had and the accomplishments, we kept on going back and forth, back and forth. And now they have a messenger from Allah amongst their midst. If we believe now, we will never be able to regain that victory. And he says, by Allah, we will never believe in it. I will never believe in it. And that was a statement of arrogance that literally, not just that, but also how, his, how vile he was to the Muslims and the Messenger of Allah them later on. You see how that vileness comes back and he has a, a miserable death when it comes to uh, Battle of Badr, right? But you look at Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl. These are individuals that they didn't have necessarily a very a negative, like a, a adverse, like, you know, disgust towards the religion at first, but more so for political reasons, they said, okay, we want to engage in this. And they stayed non-Muslim and they actually fought against the messenger of Allah in all three major battles of Islam. Could you imagine that? These individuals who heard the Quran that were mesmerized by the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three nights in a row, right? How many Muslims can say, 
that for three nights in a row, not just three nights in your life and three nights throughout Ramadan, but three nights in a row, you were so engrossed in the Quran. You were so involved in the Quran that it kept you from going to sleep. Three nights in a row. This was the reality of these individuals. But even after that, even after that, um, they were still opponents. They were still the enemies to Islam and to the messenger of Allah and to the cause of Islam for a very, very long time. Imagine a decade plus going by and you are still the enemy of the messenger of Allah. Why am I talking about this? You look at three individuals who are all Qurashi Arabs who understood the language. Think of the greatest scholar of this time, right? Maybe someone not even from you know the Western world. We're talking about someone from the Eastern world who maybe their language itself is Arabic, right? Their first language is Arabic. And on top of that, from kindergarten, like literally from like nursery school, since they were babies, there are still scholars today who are produced who their mothers, but this is a common thing in Mauritania, by the way, that their mothers, instead of reading like nursery rhymes, like twinkle, twinkle, little star, they'll <laughs> read mutun of Islamic sciences, about hadith sciences, and about like Quranic sciences. So imagine these kids without even knowing it, without even having these things develop, they've learned Islamic sciences through poetry and songs through their mothers before they even start classes in school. And then they start and go through elementary school and middle school and high school, and they continue to a higher education. And they have their scholars on the side spending decades upon decades in the service of trying to learn this religion. Do you think the greatest scholar of this time could match Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, al Akhnas, or even the average kid who was growing up in Mecca uh, in, in terms of their Arabic language? Do you think they'd be comparable? Who's, whose language skills would be higher? Whose comprehension and appreciation for the language would be deeper? Someone whose natural tongue it is, or someone who has to seek it out at a much deeper level, right? So it's this is also the, the, the um, probably one of the most bitter pills to swallow as students of the Quran. At the end of the day, this journey is not about understanding, right? If it was just about understanding, well, Abu Sufyan already beat us to it far, far ahead, right? Abu Jahl will absolutely blow us away in terms of understanding. Abu Lahab absolutely will blow us away in terms of understanding. He'll run laps around us. Like you're, you have like a kindergarten level Arabic. What's wrong with you, right? Like he'll, he'll laugh, laugh and, and scoff at us. Not to say that the scholars of today, like they, they, they don't understand the language, but the difference between the caliber of uh, and the grasp of the language will be very different. You can get at a very high level of studying it, but someone whose native language it is, right? It comes to them naturally versus someone who has to acquire it. It's much more difficult. So it's not just about understanding the language. It's not just understanding the passage, but it's really, it's the other part of it, right? What we talked about yesterday, to the book, reflecting over it and saying, how does this apply? How do I connect this to my life? And that was the missing element for Abu Jahl at least. Abu Sufyan and Akhnas, alhamdulillah, radiallahu anhumah, they came around and accepted Islam. What a blessing for them that even though they opposed the messenger of Allah for over a decade, they fought against him. They caused him distress in so many ways. Allah saved them. And they came to Islam. And they were individuals who then fought alongside the messenger of Allah. They defended the messenger of Allah. They loved the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa But that change didn't come overnight. For some Sahaba, literally was not even overnight. They heard the recitation of the Quran from the mouth of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they took the shahada right then and there. Others, it literally took decade plus. It took still fighting against the messenger of Allah. And this is a huge lesson for us when it comes to our own life, when it comes to our family members, our siblings, when it comes to non-Muslim friends or family members or colleagues or people that we know, don't expect that just because something that was very profound to you and it moved you and it changed you and it brought so much good into your life, that it will have the exact same effect on somebody else right away. It might be that something even simpler, something that was taught to them, it caused so much change and so much uh, uh, a profound change in their lives, but yet for you, it didn't do anything. And for others, it could be that it takes years upon years of work, and that's finally when this change comes about in their lives. So really, it's a lesson for us, the Messenger of Allah, Sadam, he didn't give up on any of these individuals, right? Even towards uh, uh, the end of the, the Meccan stent, or rather the, the middle of the Meccan stent, even though Abu Jahl was someone who was a vile enemy, 
he would make dua, oh Allah, let one of the Umars, Umar radiallahu anhu, or Abu Jahl, let them accept Islam. He didn't give up on these individuals until finally it was the moment of battle. And now, okay, now this is what has to happen, right? It's the moment where uh, the, the truth meets falsehood in the physical battlefield. And this is what happened. But these, these individuals, some of them who Allah allowed them to live through these battles, and then subhanAllah, they came to Islam. It just shows us that don't give up hope on an individual in your life who you feel like, nope, you know, I, I told them, I gave them this Mufti Mank lecture. I shared this lecture with them. I shared this quote with them. And they haven't changed. They're still not praying. Right. And it's like the messenger of Allah poured his heart and soul into people. And you give someone like a, you know, a 30 second TikTok and you're like, this is going to change their life. Right. And uh, subhanAllah, some people literally a message like that as they're scrolling through whatever. Right. All like the Andrew Tate junk, they're going through it all of a sudden, like Mufti Meng shows up or someone or Homer shows up or like Humble Yusuf, somebody shows up all of a sudden. And they're like, wait, what, what is this? What is this Islam? Right. And even now today, like if you go on to social media, you'll find so many non-muslim so many people accepting islam in ways that you wouldn't even expect it right like i came across this video of this person or that person or i met this uh, i saw a hijabi uh, a woman on campus and i uh, asked her about what she uh, there's so many people avenues and ways that people are coming to islam so for us the main thing is remembering that the prophetic model in this realm was that don't give up on an individual and say this person's far gone the only time the messenger of allah was told not to engage with someone, right? That these people are too far gone is when Allah says, I am telling you now, these specific people will not believe. These specific people will not come around, right? And that is the only time when the likes of Nuh salam, finally says, oh, that's the case here, Allah? Okay, then in that case, wipe them out. But if you told me there's still a chance, I'll be in the trenches and I'll keep on doing what I have to do, right? 950 years of that. And when he's finally told, after this, there will be no one that comes and believes after this, that's when Nuh salam, says, don't leave a single one, Ya Allah. Because I've seen them generation after generation after generation. 950 years of doing this da'wah and only about 80 individuals, not 80 families, 80 individuals are there with Nuh salam, Right? And that's, that was the, the, the really the methodology of almost every single prophet and messenger. No matter how much grief their people caused them, they they didn't want to abandon that. They didn't want to abandon them and say, I'm done with them. It's over, right? There will be moments of distress and grief because they're human beings, right? There are moments of extreme hurt and extreme pain, but you see the resolve of these messengers that coming, coming back over and over again, specifically five of them who are considered ulul azam, min al-rusul, those who had just an incredible resolve. Nothing could keep them down. They keep on coming back over and over again, no matter how bad things get. Anyone know who, who the five, those five prophets and messengers are? Ulul Azm, Ulul Azmi min al Rusul, five prophets and messengers. Who are they? Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and obviously Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Khatam al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Okay, with that, let's go into a couple more stories. Um, we talked about uh, Abu Jahl, we talked about Al Akhnas, and we talked about Abu Sufyan. And again, which of the two accepted Islam of these three? Abu Sufyan did. And Al Akhnas bin Shurik. Al Akhnas, I'm sure, is a name that you know many people, many folks we haven't heard. Abu Jahl, obviously, we've heard his name as well, right? But uh, he obviously did not accept Islam. Then we will go to now um, the story of let's go to Umar radiallahu anhu as well as uh, Tufail, who I really wanted to share his story as well. For Umar radiallahu anhu, um, one thing I want to just point out for you guys is that when it comes to Sira and when it comes to historical incidents that happened, there's a different level of grading those narrations and how Sira works than it does when it comes to, for example, fiqh and when it comes to aqidah and when it comes to other principles or when it comes to even virtues and fadail, right? This is all in the sciences of hadith and narrations and stuff. So typically, if, for example, um, you might hear these narrations and then you, you might see that the hadith says, okay, this is slightly weak or has some weakness in it. But when it comes to narrating sira, it's not taken to the same um, strenuous level and extent of uh, verification. And why is that? Think about this. When it comes to fiqh, application of how you pray, how you fast, how you actually live this, this Islamic life in terms of rituals and practice, the scholar said, we want the highest level possible 
of scrutiny of these hadith because we want to make sure that whatever we're practicing is something that the Messenger of Allah absolutely had said, right? But when it comes to, for example, a hadith being graded or a, a statement being graded a little bit lower in terms of uh, its grading in terms of authenticity, if it comes to a historical incident that does not have to do with, for example, the way we pray, the way we fast, and only one person narrated it, right? And for example, the person says that, you know, I heard this from, from this person, right? And uh, this is, you know, entire realm of hadith sciences. I don't want to give you too much depth into all these because, you know, go into a really long tangent. But imagine you heard this and there's a slight weakness in that. Well, if we're saying that someone's narrating an incident that occurred, we don't need this same strenuous level as, for example, of a hadith about, for example, the messenger of Allah وسلم, receiving something about fasting or zakah. For that, we want something to be very, very authentic. So, for example, in the realm of fiqh and usul al fiqh, uh, in fiqh specific, you don't apply a hadith that is weak. You don't apply a hadith and uh, have application on that, right? When it comes to virtues, sure, we can have virtues and we can take from virtues and good deeds and encouraging people to do good. Yeah, we can take weakness in it, but not, not extreme weakness, right? And this is a realm that scholars talked about in detail. Inshallah, you guys can join the Islamic studies program and learn more about that. But the reason why I'm sharing this is because, yes, some of these are slightly weak, but it's like, imagine, for example, um, many of the news reports you'll hear on the news, right? The whole fake news concept, right? Though many news reports you'll hear, maybe it's a singular source. Many of the hadith and traditions that we have, they are far stronger than what you would hear on a regular news day cycle because the verification process that the scholars went through, the men and the women that were in this entire realm, it was something that is, you know, it's such a beautiful detailed science. It's not something that was just put together. And some people call it, they try to make fun of it and say it's like a glorified uh, game of telephone or something, right? You guys played the game telephone before? Or uh, they call it Chinese whisper or telephone where you're basically just whispering something in someone's ear and it kind of gets passed around and it's like, oh, this is the final hadith. No, no, not at all. Trust me. There is so much um, detail and depth into the science that by studying it, you're like, it only increases your iman and being able to say, subhanAllah, how, the lengths that these men and women, Arab and non-Arab, went to to preserve the statements of the messenger of Allah and also to say, wait a minute, these are weak or these are fabricated. These are lies being spread about the messenger of Allah. It only increases your iman. Wallahi. For, for the beginners, when you look at it, you're like, ah, oh, this is so daunting. But the more and more you learn about it and you go through it, you say, subhanAllah, this is something that strengthens our iman. Um, so with that, let's go into some of the narrations about Umar radiallahu anhu um, uh, regarding Islam. So he says that one night, and it was common, obviously, before Islam, the Arabs just in general were known to be a very um, uh, big society when it came to drinking, right? Drinking and, and kind of, you know, horses and trade and, and partying and this kind of lifestyle. When you're in a desert, there's only so much you can do, right? Um, <laughs> I was about to make some more statements about that, but I'll leave it alone. Um, so Umar radiallahu anhu, he says one night he had gotten intoxicated. And he said that he was going to basically jump the messenger of Allah. Sallam. He knew that the Prophet Sallam would come to the Kaaba and he would pray at night. So what Umar anhu did is that he got behind the ghilaf, the cloth of the Kaaba, and he's there at nighttime. He's just waiting. Okay, I'm gonna, could you imagine this like this awkward, this strange situation of someone just standing behind like the cloth of the Kaaba and Allah and maybe the cloth came all the way down and it was not it was covered up all the way. And even that marble, that base that's there for anybody who's who's been or seen pictures, right? There's a marble kind of base that kind of goes like this, right? That it's kind of on a slant. And that most likely, obviously, that wasn't wasn't there. It was probably most likely just a straight structure. Um, so you could maybe kind of blend in more. You wouldn't be just like standing on this marble structure. So he says that he was there. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reciting the Quran. And as he was reciting, Umar radiallahu anhu starts having this internal dialogue. And he says to himself, man, this is, this is something else. He is really a talented poet or something. He must have such eloquence. Like these verses are so captivating. In a state when he's not fully there, but he's like, wow. This is so captivating. He's an amazing poet. And the Messenger of Allah Sallam, as he says that, recites in the next verse, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْنِ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ He says, the verses uh, say the translation is, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْنِ شَاعِرٍ And it is not, it is absolutely not the statement of a poet. قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ How little you believe. And Umar radiallahu anhu like takes like an inner gasp, like, 
He says, oh my God, how did he know that? How do you know what I was thinking? Especially like in a state when he's like, not fully there, probably even more paranoid about what's going on. He's like, oh, how did he know what I was thinking? He must be a magician. He must be a soothsayer. And the very next ayat, Allah SWT in Surah Al-Haqqa, the Messenger of Allah recites, وَلَا بِقَوْنِ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ And it is absolutely not the speech of a soothsayer, someone who's in, dabbling with the jinn and magic and these kind of things. How little do you remember? And this is now like, you know, going crazy for, for him. And the very next ayat are what? تَنزِيلٌ مِّن رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Rather, it is revelation from the Rabbil Alameen, from the nurturer, the creator, the sustainer, the provider of all of creation. And then that's when Umar anhu says, دَخَلَ شَيْءٌ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ فِي قَلْبِي Like a little bit of Islam, that something of Islam entered my heart on that night. So that was the first moment where he's like, okay, this is, I'm getting to hear the Quran for the first time, but in a state where he's not fully there. And it's like, okay, maybe there's something to this. Maybe there's a truth to this. Fast forward a little bit where now the opposition has become much more. There are more people now amongst the, the Qurayshis who are accepting Islam. What happens now? As more and more accepting Islam, family members and tribes members are kind of separating and they're having a lot of contention because, wait a minute, my son or my wife or my daughter or my, my, my uh, husband has accepted Islam and I can't accept this. How could they betray their forefathers? How could they betray their own parents and leave their religion behind? So Umar anhu says to himself, how do I put an end to this? How do we stop this? We've tried every single thing. We've tried to offer him money. We try to offer him leadership. We try to offer him Women, we try to offer him anything and everything under the sun. It's not working. Let me take this into my own hands. In some kind of pseudo noble way, he's thinking to himself, if I kill him, what will happen is they will take my life. But at least that will mean that society can go back to normal and all this nonsense will, will end. So he thinks that's it. I'm going to do it. Right. Almost like this weird valiant kind of, you know, this uh, anti-hero kind of mindset situation going on. Let me finish him off. Don't finish me. And at least people will go back to peace. So he is sword drawn, has his sword ready, and he's walking to the home where the messenger of Allah is. And a undercover Muslim at that moment is like, Umar, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to Muhammad. I'm going to finish this. And he says, why are you so worried about Muhammad when you have your own household to take care of? Right? So what he did is like the whole, like uh, the misdirection. <laughs> instead of instead of stopping him from going to the, the messenger of Allah, he unfortunately threw his sister, Umar's sister under the bus, who was also a secret Muslim. And he's like, what? My sister? He's like, let me go take care of her first before I go, go to the messenger of Allah, right? Before I go to Muhammad, so I said them. So he then goes to the house of his sister, Fatima, and he bangs on the door. And actually in that moment is Khabbab ibn al-Arat is inside, who was a slave, uh, um, a young man who was teaching the sister of Umar radiallahu anhu, and the brother-in-law of Umar radiallahu anhu, he was their Quran tutor. He was their teacher. He was the one teaching them the Quran, right? Not uh, not like pronunciation, tajweed, but teaching them the actual Quran, the revelation that was coming. And this is what he had learned from the Messenger of Allah. And he's going to the homes and teaching people. And could you imagine? Umar radiallahu anhu, who his physical stature, just in case you didn't know, um, the description was that whenever Ibn Mas'ud, who was known to be a very a, a smaller, frail companion, when Ibn Mas'ud would be standing up and Umar radiallahu anhu would be sitting like on his knees, they would be about the same height. So imagine Umar radiallahu anhu being like this giant of a man and Ibn Mas'ud being someone smaller. And all of a sudden you hear this deep voice of Umar radiallahu anhu banging on the door and saying, open up, what are you doing in there? And Khabbab, poor guy, probably like this, you know, all of a sudden, like if you rode like a roller coaster, or have like those, the panic moment where your heart like comes all the way over here. You're like, oh my goodness, this, this will be, this will be the last day. In the Allah, you the your own. It's time for me to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're his family. Maybe they'll survive, but there's no way I'm going to make it out. I have no protection from anybody, right? I'm just a slave, a person in society who has little to no value in his eyes, most likely. So they hide Khabbab. Khabbab goes hide somewhere in the home. And now the brother-in-law and the sister of Umar are there. And he says, what, what were you doing in there? And they're trying to play coy. No, nothing. We weren't doing anything at all. And Umar then proceeds to basically physically just pummel 
and destroy his brother-in-law and his wife, uh, his uh, sister Fatima is trying to peel her, his brother, uh, her brother rather, off of her husband. And in that process, Umar anhu strikes her as well. And that's the moment where Umar kind of, okay, I, I went too far. I struck my sister and, you know, I'll beat up my brother-in-law all I want, but not my sister. I can't, I can't, I can't cause pain to her. Finally, when things kind of calm down and cooler heads prevail, he says, show me what, what you have. What are you, what are you doing? What are you engaging in? What is this Quran? And he had had the experience before, right? We know he had this experience before, but this is the first time when Umar radiallahu anhu in a, in a solid state of mind, in a clear state of mind, is going to engage with the Quran himself. And he's from the few people who's actually literate enough to read the actual mushaf or the, not, it wasn't the mushaf at the time, but the actual writing of the Quran. So he is given, after cleaning up, purifying himself, he is given uh, Surah Taha, not, not in its entirety, but the first portion. And I won't go over all of it, but I want to go over a little bit of it to give you an understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Taha, and actually, you know what? I'll screen share and I'll open up so you guys can follow along with the translation. I think that'll be beneficial, more, even more beneficial for you guys, inshallah. Um, Dr. Khattab's translation preloaded, mashallah. They know what they're doing. Or maybe it's because I always set it up. Maybe it's already on there. Okay. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana litashqa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Taha, we have not sent down this Qur'an to you, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu so that you could be miserable. So that you'd be miserable. Umar radiallahu anhu in his mind is thinking, all this Quran has done, all this idea of revelation has done, is make the people of Mecca miserable. All these things that are going on. So the first idea that he has being challenged, that all this distress and families being broken apart because of this Islam, because of this Tawheed, because of this oneness of Allah, worshiping Allah alone, giving people their rights, all of this has caused such a ruckus in our society. Allah goes on and he says, Rather, it is a reminder to the one who is in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it is revelation. Ah, this is very similar to what he heard before. Allah is saying something different over here. He's saying, uh, not different, but in a different uh, lens of it, right? He is saying it is revelation from the one who created the earth and who created the heavens, the high, the heaven so high. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman wa ala al-arsh istawa. The abundantly merciful, the one who rises above his throne, who establishes himself above the throne. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard wa ma bainahuma wa ma taht al-thara. Ev lahu. Uh, did you guys learn lahu yet? The lamb? Not yet? Okay. When you learn it, the lamb is for possession. It typically means for, right? Don't, I don't want you to start translating for him is. You don't say that in English. You say to him belongs, right? Something belongs to him. What belongs to him? Ma fi samawati wa ma fi al You reorder the, the, the sentence to be able to convey it in English. So it's ma fi samawati. This is a ma of what? Whatever is in the heavens, whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth and whatever is in between the heavens and the earth and whatever is under the earth itself, the soil itself, it belongs to him. And whatever you speak aloud or whatever, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 whatever you speak aloud and without, certainly he knows whatever is secret or even more hidden than that and then Allah says Allah whenever you see Allah's name right in the beginning this is a very interesting concept. You know how, how do you translate huwa, Allahu? 
Huwa Allahu. He is Allah, right? Well, the Huwa isn't there. It's supposed to be implied. It's supposed to be Huwa Allahu. Translate for me. Huwa Allahu. He is Allah. La ilaha illahu. Translate that for me. La ilaha. There is nothing worthy of worship. Illa. Except. Hu. Huwa. Except him. We don't worship anything except him. When you take that first huwa away, you know how the translation works with that? It's Allah. There is nothing worthy of worship except him. You could say the implication is he is Allah. There's nothing worthy of worship except him, right? I have to give you a silly example to make sense in English, but nothing can compare to this, right? If I said, for example, he is a, he is a baller, right? He is a baller, opposed to baller, right? Like imagine just like, instead of being like, he is LeBron James, I'm like, LeBron, like this man's insane, right? The idea is that you're not even talking about, you're not even establishing the, the entity first. You're like, I used to get to the part where it's like, I'm amazed by this. You're not saying who Allah. In the other parts of the Quran, you say that. When you see these verses that start off with Allah, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. Allah. La ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. There's nothing worthy of worship except Him. Al hayy al qayyum. The one who is ever living. The one who is always on guard, taking care of the, the, the needs of the creation, who is the guardian, the protector. Right? There's a power to it. And this is even, this is the part of the language where you know the basic rule of how it works. But it not working the way that it works is also part of the beauty of it. Because you didn't learn what is what it looks like when it's not there. You learn what who Allah is. But you didn't learn what just the word Allah by itself. You're like, yeah, Allah, what, what's the big deal, right? But there's an element of suspense. There's an element of like getting right to the point. Uh, that's part of the language. And that's really when you study the language, you're like, oh, okay. We learn the rules to sometimes understand the rules themselves. And sometimes to learn, well, what happens when you break the rule? What happens when you change things up? And you're like, oh, wait a minute. This is adding even more eloquence, even more flavor to what's being mentioned over here. So Umar al is reading now, Allah, there is nothing worthy of worship except him. Lahul asma al husna. He possesses these beautiful names. Wahal ataka hadith musa ra. Have you heard, have the story of Musa alayhi salam come to you? The hadith of Musa. Now, the Arabs, the Qurayshis, do they know about Musa alayhi salam? Yes or no? What do you think? How do they know about Musa alayhi salam? The Jews, right? There's Jewish tribes from Medina. They interact with these individuals. They, they know, obviously know Ibrahim alayhi salam, the one who built the Kaaba. They know of the history of all these things. And Musa alayhi salam is someone who's familiar to them. So now think about it. Umar radiallahu anhu says, he's reading this thing, the passage has a story of Musa come to you, where he says, I, uh, he saw a fire and he said to his family, He says that, stay over here and I'm going to go to this fire that I see and perhaps I'll be able to uh, uh, bring back a torch from it, bring some light for us, or find some guidance at the fire. Now what Musa means is not like guidance, Islamic spiritual guidance, right? He's talking about find the direction, find the way, right? SubhanAllah, but the guidance he was going to get is something even more profound. So he says Huda, but what's meant by this Huda is the guidance of Islam. And the even more trippier thing about this is Musa didn't speak Arabic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is divinely translating the thoughts and the implications of Musa alayhi salam. And he's putting these double layered meanings into the actual statement of Musa alayhi salam, which is insane because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the translator of Nuh alayhi salam, is the translator of Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun and all these prophets and messengers and individuals in the Quran that didn't speak Arabic. Could you imagine that Allah is a translator and typically if you've ever translated anything before, you have to either translate the intent or the word, right? You have to translate the flavor. You can't do everything at once. This is why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the same situation and use different words. And it's the same portion, but he'll describe it in different ways to show you layers of what's going on. Because the situation, any situation in life is multifaceted. There's multiple layers of what's happening. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the divine translator of all these things. So he says that Musa alayhi salam, he intended guidance. But this deeper guidance was going to be given to him. And then imagine going back to Umar radiallahu anhu. 
He's being told of a story of a prophet who is now about to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's about to engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he himself was on the way to kill a prophet who is claiming to receive revelation from God, who is engaging with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See what happens in these verses as they go on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and as, uh, as uh, Umar al-Dhan continues on reading, And when he approaches this fire, a call is made out to him. He was called out and says, Musa. And there's nobody there, right? What's going on? And the call goes on and the statement goes on. I am your Rabb. I am. Without a question, in me. Ana Rabbuka. I am your Rabb, your creator, your sustainer, your provider. Take off your na'alik, your sandals, for you are in a sacred valley of Tuwa. And I have chosen you, subhanAllah. He's hearing that Allah has chosen Musa alayhi salam as a prophet, as a messenger. The man you are going to kill is also chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's so much probably going through the Umar of the mind right now as he's going through this passage. Innani, oh sorry, uh, the portion before I have chosen you, yuha. So listen attentively, listen very closely to what's being revealed to you. Innani ana Allah, la ilaha illa ana fa'budu, fa'budni, fa'budni wa aqimi salata li dhikri. He says, Innani ana Allah. There is absolutely no doubt. There is no question. Ana Allah. Translation, Ana Allah. I am Allah, Allah says to him. La ilaha illa, not illahu, illa ana. Allah is saying there is absolutely nothing worthy of worship except ana, except me. Fa'budni, worship me, worship me. Wa aqimi salata li dhikri. And establish the prayer. Be regular with this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For what purpose? This is the lam again, a purpose. For my remembrance. To remember me. Here's a question for all of us. Think about like the most famous person or someone who you really look up to, right? You meet them for the first time. You interact with them for the first time. And you're just like shell-shocked. Like, oh my God, I can't believe I got to meet this person. Would you ever forget that interaction, right? Never. When Musa alayhi salam is speaking to the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he's telling him, Musa, I am your Rabb, I am your creator, there's nothing worthy of worship except me. Would he ever forget this interaction? Nope. But Allah is telling him, Wa aqim salata li dhikri. Establish the salah, the prayer, for my remembrance. Guaranteed Musa alayhi salam is never going to never forget this, this moment in his life. But as a messenger, a prophet of Allah salam, he's being told, to have a connection, to remember me properly. This salah is essential. This was what every single prophet and messenger came with. Even when you go to the Old Testament, when you go to the Bible, you see that the prophets and messengers, even in their scriptures, were praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, were bowing, were putting their face on the ground to God, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was part and parcel of every single messenger's mission to connect human beings to God himself, to connect Allah, to connect human beings with their creator. So this was something that was told to Musa salam. And after this incident of where Umar who's come into his sister's home, he's now read the Quran for himself. He says, take me to the messenger of Allah salam. And he says, I want to accept Islam. This is, you, this is where we see the profound ability of the Quran to cause change. We talked about before individuals who spent over a decade being enemies of the messenger of Allah salam, who fought against him who were adamantly against him until the last moment. It was only actually, I should have mentioned this, it was only after Fath Mecca, where literally they had to give up and say, you won. Muhammad, you got Mecca back. You've won. You've overpowered us. We give up. It was only at that moment where they say, okay, we'll accept Islam now. It was when they were submitted into, like, into defeat 
It's not that they were like willingly coming forward and saying, I want to go do this. No, it's we have no, no ground to stand on anymore. And the messenger of Allah, what could he have done? All right, bring all those people that wanted to fight against me. Off with their heads. We're going to finish every single one of them. Only one or two people had that kind of treatment. The dozens and dozens of individuals who were enemies of the messenger of Allah, he said, Antum la There is no blame on you all today. I say to you as a brother, as, as Yusuf السلام, said to his brothers, you are free. There is no harm on you today. There is no blame on you today. And rather what he does, does when the messenger of Allah returns to Mecca is he honors these individuals. And he says, anybody who is in the home of Abu Sufyan, they will find peace and they will find, they will have no animosity towards them. No one will harm, uh, harm them. Anybody who's at the Kaaba, anybody who's at Ahmed bin Churais, these very same individuals that fought against him, he's honoring them now, subhanAllah. Just the, the, the mercy of the messenger of Allah. So uh, going back to uh, the story over here, Umar radiallahu anhu, even though he was an enemy of Islam and the Muslims for a while and the Messenger of Allah for a couple of years, when the Quran came to him and it hit him, he changed his lifestyle in the moment where he, as he was going to kill the Messenger of Allah, in a few minutes time, the Quran changed. The speech of Allah changed his heart to the extent where he says, I want to be a follower of this man. I am not going to be an enemy any longer. I'm not going to cause him any physical hostility. I will be the one who will stand up for him. If any harm comes to him, I'll be the one who will take the proverbial bullet for him, right? I'll be the one that defends his honor. I'll be the one that physically protects him. And Umar radiallahu anhu is now going to the home where the messenger of Allah is. The Sahaba who are there are saying, Ya Rasulullah, it's Umar at the door. And him and Hamza radiallahu anhu, Allahumma salli wa sallim. Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, uh, Hamza radiallahu anhu and the messenger of Allah sallam, they basically say that let him in if he intends good we'll give him good and if he wants any trouble we'll, we'll take care of him right and they get to him and they kind of like rough him up a little bit and they say what do you want Umar and the, Umar radiallahu anhu comes to the messenger of Allah and he says I want you to pay attention to the Arabic over here ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna ka wa anna ka rasulullah not that's what we say, right? We say, What are we saying? Translate. I bear witness, I testify. There is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He didn't have to say that. He said, What? What does that mean? That you are the messenger of Allah. Imagine that moment where he was the enemy of the messenger of Allah uh, so long. Hamza radiallahu anhu was ready to like, you know, I, if I, I, gotta, I gotta do what I gotta do, right? This is my, my nephew. If he wants to mess around with him, he wants to, and he had, Hamza had already accepted Islam at this point, by the way. So Umar radiallahu anhu now, he accepts Islam. And very shortly after this, after the Islam of Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Ya Rasulullah, we have a level of strength. We, are, we have a number now. We're not as the majority over here. But what we'll do is one side Hamza, one side Umar radiallahu anhu, as believers we will march in front of the entire city and we will pray in front of them and we will see what they will do, right? Could you imagine the moment where the two greatest warriors of, of Quraysh, of Mecca, one side Hamza radiallahu anhu, one side Umar radiallahu anhu, you have the messenger of Allah sallallahu and you have these believers or you have Bilal, you have Ibn Mas'ud, people who the the the... the a higher ups are scoffing at me like, oh my God, what are these people doing with them? But they can't even touch them. Why? Because you have Hamza on one side and Umar on the other side, right? You have these two giants who you know you don't want to get into a battle with, you don't want to get into a, a situation with. Umar radiallahu anhu, and I, inshallah we'll, we'll see this in the Umar series. After he accepts Islam, he goes to the leaders of the Quraysh as if like he's like um, giving them like a personal kind of, you know, uh, 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 kind of a shot to them in their face, basically. He went to their homes and he says, have you heard? I accept Islam. And they're like, like, what terrible news? Like, why, why do you have to come to my house and tell me this, right? I don't want to hear this nonsense. And he's going now, all the people that he was saying that, yes, we're going to go on top of Muhammad we're going to, we're going to de destroy these people. I'm, I'm one of them now. Tell me what you want to do now, right? And he's like, they're like, you were with us a second ago. Like, what, what happened, right? How did everything shift all of a sudden? And that was the main, hopefully, kind of takeaway that we can uh, uh, benefit from today, which is, the Quran, this revelation, the statements of the Messenger of Allah, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down to us, it has profound ability to cause change in our lives. 
and the lives of our family members, of our friends, the people that we like to interact with and people that we don't like to interact with. Our enemies, non-Muslims, atheists, the most liberal, the most wacky, cuckoo people, it doesn't matter who these people are. The Quran has the ability to cause so much profound change in people's lives. But we have to look at what the Messenger of Allah did. Not give up on people, right? Not give up on the fact that we have to try to deliver this message in the best way possible as the Messenger of Allah did. With gentleness, with kindness, with love, with sincerity, with care for people. The Messenger of Allah, his default disposition was... وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as an embodiment of mercy, of compassion, of care, of forgiveness. لِلْعَالَمِينَ Not للصحابة, not للمؤمنين, not للمتقين, لِلْعَالَمِينَ not for the believers, not just for the Sahaba, not just for the, the most God conscious. We have sent you as a beacon of hope, an embodiment of care for all of creation. And this is how the Messenger of Allah did da'wah. When you and I call family members or friends, when we're calling non-Muslims, whoever it may be, we don't come in with the thing that, well, I'm just here to establish the truth. And if they take it, they take it. If they don't, they don't, whatever. It's on them, right? The Messenger of Allah didn't have this attitude of, I'm just here to kind of give the message and I'm going to walk away, right? Even though the Messenger of Allah was told, uh, Don't worry, Ya Rasulullah. You're not responsible if they follow or not. But he wanted them to follow. He says the example of him to, to, the, to human beings is that he is like a man who is at a fire and there are moths. And he says that you are all like moths going to this fire. And I'm trying to hold you back and pull you away from this fire. And this fire is representative of the fire of hell. And he's saying he's trying to prevent these people, hold them back, pull them back. The Messenger of Allah does not want to see anyone in the fire. It does not want to see anyone go through punishment. The Messenger of Allah is trying to pull these people back. So for him, it is painful. It is painful when they don't follow. Literally, Allah says in Surah Kaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that verse that perhaps you would die out of grief. Perhaps you would die out of grief and sadness if they didn't follow you, if they didn't follow what you were coming with. That was how deeply it affected the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to not have individuals follow this deen. So for you and I, being able to have that side of compassion to us when we're calling our kids or calling our family members to Islam, be patient with them, right? People don't change overnight. What we can do is make dua for them. What we can do is try to guide them closer to the, the ayat, the miraculous signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the life of the messenger of Allah. And that truly is the goal of this class. For the past, I forgot how many, you know, iterations we've done. I think maybe, I think Sophia said four or five. I forgot how many, you know, batches we've had at this point. But every single time, the focus would primarily be Quranic studies. And whenever I would teach my Sierra classes for Islamic studies, which would only be like, you know, once a semester, and this semester I'm not even teaching it, Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah got to do Shema'il and I was kind of bumped out and I was like, okay, y'all want to bump me out of Shema'il? Don't worry, I got you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and take my own class. I'm going to make my own class and it'll be every other week, inshallah. It'll be what we're engaging in. But my idea was that, look, the main connection that believers need to have is number one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't know who Allah is and you don't love him, how will you love this religion? If you don't know who the messenger of Allah Sallallahu is, you don't know who his personality is and who he is, how can you want to follow the sunnah? How can you want to follow this religion, right? So this entire class, the goal of it is to connect people to number one, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and his revelation and connect them to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his sunnah and how he lived this life, how he lived this deen. So this class that we're engaging in, I've titled it for everybody else, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? I've titled it that. But how we're going to study it is through the Quran as well as the incidents. And inshallah, we'll see it actually being acted out as well through Umar series. And that'll also be a great kind of uh, a package with that. So inshallah, with that, we'll go ahead and, and conclude over here for today. Um, not next week, but the week after, we're going to be starting basically now talking about the Messenger of Allah Sallam. And we're not going to start the Sira right away. Probably next, uh, uh, the next class that we have, it's going to be dedicated to the Messenger of Allah in the Quran, 
How does Allah speak about him? What are the virtues of the Messenger of Allah? Various things that are kind of setting the foundation of it. And we'll probably start Sirah as well, perhaps on Sunday. But my recommendation, if you have friends, family, whether they're in Houston, they're not in Houston, invite them to the class. If they can come in person, great. If they're going to be online, wonderful. No problems, inshallah. We also have student discounts as well. Um, and also, as, as you guys know, uh, whatever we do at the seminary, whatever we do at Suhba, period, whether it's Islamic studies, the marriage stuff, we always have financial aid available. So if there's anybody who can't afford it anywhere, whatever the situation is, just tell them to come and join the class, inshallah. Uh, just tell them to go on to, uh, what is it called? Suhba.com slash series, I believe. Or if you go to Instagram, you'll find the post and you can find the link over there. And I'll share it with you guys in the WhatsApp group as well. Share that with your friends and family. So Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, we will see you guys. Um, I'll, I'll make sure the link is sent for you for next week's class, which will be Science of the Quran. So y'all are more than welcome to attend online. I'll ask Safiya if there's space over here. Maybe we can open up some sign-up sheets for you guys. And maybe you can, maybe we can get like four or five of you guys to come over here. But it really depends on how many students we'll already have over here because I'm sure it'll be a packed house. Jazakumullah khairan, subhanahu wa alayhi wa ilaha 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 ant, astaghfirullahu alayhi wa Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Take care, guys. Which one? <coughs> Quran app? Oh yeah, it's very good. Yeah, mashallah. And actually, what's really cool is that it, I, I might have shown this to you guys. If you click the, if you actually click the words over here. Yeah, that's right. You got pronunciation. It's got the meaning, right? Yeah. This was actually my my teacher. He went through the entire Quran and read word by word. Does it have the app that you can? I think Quran Explorer is the Quran Explorer app. So the Quran Explorer app, I believe they use the same one, if I'm not mistaken. Let's get this app. Is that the same app? I think, I think so. If you click it's it. It's different. That's a problem. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't do the same so features. Like it doesn't right? Yeah. It's no. Mm, yeah. Like that one is different, right? I mean, you no, catch I, every I, word. I have it. I think Sophia has it. But one second. I, I, I found it. Oh, it's, Quran, it's Quran hype. That's what it was. Ah, it's not Quran.com. Let me see. It's different. What's the, what's yeah, the app? Let me just check. That's the one I'm talking about. Yep. That's yeah. So, so, but what's the app? And you also have Ustad Duman's tafsir over here as well for each ayah. That's really awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah but what's the app? I want to download it's called Quran Hive. Can, can I see the... the sure. Are we going to do this? Quran Hive. HIV. Uh, it? Ah, it's still Quran.com. Quran it's Quran Hive, you see? Because this one is Quran.com. Yes. So if you go this with one. it... Yep, that's it. Oh, okay. So if you go over there, you get Quran.com. That's not the same. I wish there was like one app that had all these amazing features, but it's like you have to have like two, three different yeah, Quran yeah. apps. Like literally I have three different apps because when I want to do like Arabic studies and tafsir studies, I'll go into one one app. If I want to do, you know, Quran high. looking at certain other things. Yeah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Can you hear me? Waalaikum Asalaam. Yes, I can. Um, what is a good Arabic dictionary for our learning? Uh, yeah, that's another good one have... too. For you guys, I would say... I would say before, so here's my first recommendation. Um, the vocabulary you guys have, the 80% words list, I would say try to master that to the best of your ability before even looking at an Arabic dictionary. Because the more vocabulary you acquire, even at a base level, will be great for you. But the next thing I would say is that having a solid Quran dictionary, see, there's a difference between an Arabic dictionary and a Quran dictionary. Because for most of you guys, you guys are Arabic Quranic students rather, right? You're not going to be really going into, you know, random texts outside of the Quran. So there's an amazing uh, resource I can share with you guys called the Brill Quran Dictionary. Um, that's probably the best Quranic dictionary. But for Arabic overall, you can use Hansware, you can use Maurid. But the problem is that those entries are based on modern Arabic usages. And they don't always equate to the usage in the Quran. Um, but it'll give you a good idea. It'll give you a rough idea, but you shouldn't think that, okay, this is the definitive one opposed to there are specific Quran dictionaries that are made out there. And um, Alejandro, you saw like the one that um, the Brill Quran dictionary, the, 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 what's it called? There was like a, um, oh, a picture one, right? It was like a picture dictionary or what was yeah, it? Yeah, it was uh, with the, the clear Quran, the same. Oh, the clear culture. Quran. Yeah, yeah, the clear Quran did it. Yeah, the yeah. The clear Quran now has an official, it's, it's according to Nice, nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so the third Quran has, uh, has some So Hansware is good. Maurid is good as well. You can find that app on, on most or Ma'ani, M A A N I or N um, Y, N I Y, something like that. Ma'ani. Um, those are all decent dictionaries for you guys. But for your purposes, I would say 
any time that you would dedicate to vocabulary and trying to acquire more language, I would say don't even go into dictionaries right now. Focus on the 80% words just because it'll give you the most bang for your buck. If you're going to spend time with vocabulary and dictionaries, that 80% words will give you so much more value than going and saying, oh, what does this random word mean? What does that random word mean? I would rather give you a Quran app that will just help you with each word to word thing. That would give you more benefit at this stage, in my opinion. Inshallah. Jazakallah. Well, yeah. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.